In a quiet room, if you press your ear right up against the pillow, you can hear your heartbeat. As a kid, the muffled rhythmic beats sounded like soft footsteps on a carpeted floor. So as a kid, almost every night, just as I was about to drift off to sleep, I would hear these footsteps and I would be ripped back to consciousness, terrified. For my entire childhood, I lived with my mother in a fairly nice neighborhood that was in a transitional phase. People of lower economic means were gradually moving in, and my mother and I were two of these people. We lived in the kind of house you see being transported in two pieces on the interstate, but my mom took good care of it. There were a lot of woods surrounding the neighborhood that I would play in and explore during the day, but at night, as things often do to a kid, they took on a more sinister feeling. This, coupled with the fact that due to the nature of our house, there was a fairly large crawl space underneath, filled my mind with imaginary monsters and inescapable scenarios which would consume my thoughts when I was awoken by the footsteps. I told my mom about the footsteps and she said that I was just imagining things. I persisted enough that she blasted my ears with water from a turkey baster once just to placate me, since I thought that would help. Of course it didn't. Despite all the creepiness and footsteps, the only thing that ever happened was that every now and then, I would wake up on the bottom bunk despite having gone to sleep on the top. But this wasn't really weird since I'd sometimes get up to piss or get up to get something to drink and could remember just going back to sleep on the bottom bunk. I'm an only child, so it didn't matter. This would happen once or twice a week, but waking up on the bottom bunk wasn't too terrifying. But one night, I didn't just wake up on the bottom bunk. I had heard the footsteps, but was too far gone to be woken up by them. And when I was awoken, it wasn't from the sound of footsteps or a nightmare, but because I was cold, really cold. When I opened my eyes, I saw stars. I was in the woods. I sat up immediately and tried to figure out what was going on. I thought I was dreaming, but that didn't seem right. Though neither did me being in the woods. There was a deflated pool float right in front of me. One of those ones shaped like a shark. This only added to the surreal feeling, but after a while it seemed like I wasn't just going to wake up because I wasn't asleep. I stood up to orient myself, but I didn't recognize these woods. I played in the woods by my house all the time, so I knew them really well, but if these weren't the same woods, then how could I get out? I took a step and felt a shooting pain in my foot, which knocked me back to where I would, had just been laying. I had stepped on a thorn. By the light of the moon, I could see that there were they were everywhere. I looked at my other foot, but it was fine, and as a matter of fact, so was the rest of me. I didn't have another scratch on me, and I wasn't even dirty. I cried for a little bit and then stood back up. I didn't know which way to go, so I just picked a direction. I resisted the urge to call out since I wasn't sure I wanted to be found by who or what might be out there. I walked for what felt like hours. I tried to walk in a straight line and tried to course correct when I had to take detours, but I was a kid and I was afraid. There weren't any howls or screams, and only once did I hear any noise that scared me. It sounded like a crying baby. I think now that it was just a cat. But I panicked. I ran veering in different directions to avoid big thicks of bushes and collapsed trees, and I was paying close attention to where I stepped because by that point my feet were in pretty bad shape. I paid too much attention to where I was stepping and not enough to where those f steps were leading because not long after hearing the cry, I saw something that filled me with a kind of despair I haven't experienced since... It was the pool float. I was only 10 feet from where I had woken up. This wasn't magic or some supernatural space bending. I was lost. Up until that moment, I thought more about getting out of the woods than how I got in. But being back at the beginning caused my mind to swim. I wasn't even sure that these were my woods. I'd only been hoping that they were. Had I run in a huge circle around that spot? Or did I just get turned around and start making my way back? How was I going to get out? 
At the time, I thought the North Star was just the brightest star, and so I looked and found the brightest one and followed it. Eventually, things started to look more familiar, and when I saw the ditch, uh, it's a dirt ditch my friends and I would have dirt clod wars in, I knew I had made it out. By that point, I was walking really slowly because my feet hurt so much, but I was just so happy to be so close to home that I broke into a light jog. When I actually saw the roof of my house over a neighboring lower set house, I let out a light sob and ran faster. I just wanted to be home. I had already decided that I wouldn't say anything because I had no idea what I could possibly say. I would get back in the house somehow, clean up, and get in bed. My heart sunk as I rounded the corner and my house fully came into view. Every light in the house was on. I knew my mom was up, and I knew I would have to explain, or try to explain, where I had been, and I couldn't even figure out where to start. My run became a jog, which became a walk. I saw her silhouette through the blinds, and although I was worried about how to explain things to her, that didn't matter to me at that point. I walked up the couple of steps to the porch and put my hand on the doorknob and turned. Right before I pushed it open, two arms wrapped around me and pulled me back. I screamed as loud as I could, Mom, help me, please, Mom! The feeling of being so close to being safe and then being physically pulled away from it filled me with a kind of dread that is, even after all these years, indescribable. The door I had been torn away from opened, and a flash of hope shot through my heart, but it wasn't my mom. It was a man, and he was enormous. I thrashed around and kicked at the shins of the person holding me while also trying to get away from the person who had just come out of my house. I was scared, but I was furious. Let me go! Where is she? Where's my mom? What did you do to her? As my throat stung from screaming, and I was drawing in another breath, I became aware of a sound that had been present for longer than I had perceived it. Honey, please calm down. I've got you. It sounded like my mom. The arms loosened and set me down, and as a man approaching me blocked out the porch light with his head, I noticed his clothes. He was a cop. I turned to face the voice behind me and saw that it really was my mom. Everything was okay. I began to cry, and the three of us went inside. I'm so glad you're home, sweetie. I was worried I'd never see you again. By that point, she was crying, too. I, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. I just wanted to come home. I'm sorry. It's okay. Just don't ever do that again. I'm not sure me or my shins could take it. A little laughter broke through my sobs, and I smiled a bit. Well, I'm sorry for kicking you, but why'd you have to grab me like that? I was just afraid that you'd run away again. I was confused. What do you mean? We found your note on your pillow, she said, and pointed at the piece of paper that the police officer was sliding across the table. I picked up the note and read it. It was a running away letter. It said that I was unhappy and never wanted to see her or any of my friends again. The police officer exchanged a few words with my mom on the porch while I stared at the letter. I didn't remember writing a letter. I didn't remember anything about any of this. But even if I sometimes went to the bathroom at night and didn't remember, or even if I could have gone into the woods on my own, even if all of that could have been true, the only thing I knew at that point was, this isn't how you spell my name. I didn't write this letter. Chapter 2 Balloons A couple days ago, I posted a story called Footsteps here on Slash No Sleep. There were a number of questions that made me curious about certain details about my childhood, and so I spoke with my mother. Why don't you just tell them about the goddamn balloons if they're so interested? As soon as she said that, I remembered so much about my childhood that I had forgotten. This story will provide some greater context for the previous story, which I think you should read first though the order isn't of vital importance. Reading that story first will put you in my place more effectively since I remembered the events of Footsteps first. 
If you have questions or anything, feel free to ask, and I'll try to answer them. Also, both stories are long, so heads up on that. I'm just hesitant to leave out any details that might be important. When I was five years old, I went to an elementary school that, from what I've come to understand, was really adamant about the importance of learning through activity. It was part of a new program designed to allow children to rise at their own pace, and to facilitate this, the school encouraged teachers to come up with really inventive lesson plans. Each teacher was given the latitude to create his or her own themes, which would run for the duration of the grade, and all the lessons in math, reading, and etc. would be designed in the spirit of theme. These themes were called groups. There was a space group, a sea group, an earth group, and the group I was in, community. In kindergarten in this country, you don't learn much except how to tie your shoes and how to share, so most of it isn't very memorable. I only remember two things very clearly. I was the best at writing my name the right way, and the balloon project, which was really the hallmark of the community group, since it was a pretty clever way to show how a community functioned at a really basic level. You've probably heard of this activity. On one Friday, I remember it being a Friday because I was excited about the project and it being the end of the week. Toward the beginning of the year, we walked into the classroom in the morning and saw that there was a fully inflated balloon tied off with string taped to each of our desks. Sitting on each of our desks was a marker, a pen, a piece of paper, and an envelope. The project was to write a note on the paper, put it in the envelope, and attach it to the balloon, which we could draw a picture on if we wanted. Most of the kids started fighting over the balloons because they wanted different colors. But I started on my note, which I had thought a lot about. All the notes had to follow a loose structure, but we were allowed to be creative within those boundaries. My note was something like this. Hi! You found my balloon! My name is blank, and I attend blank elementary school. You can keep the balloon, but I hope you write me back. I like Mighty Max, exploring, building forts, swimming, and friends. What do you like? Write me back soon. Here's a dollar for the mail. On the dollar, I wrote four stamps right across the front, which my mom said was unnecessary, but I thought it was genius, so I did it. The teacher took a Polaroid of each of us with our balloons and had us put them in the envelope along with our letter. They also included another letter that I assume explained the nature of the project and sincere appreciation for anyone's participation in writing back and sending photos of their city or neighborhood. That was the whole idea, to build a sense of community without having to leave the school and to establish safe contact with other people. It seemed like such a fun idea. Over the next couple weeks, the letters started to roll in. Most came with pictures of different landmarks, and each time a letter would come in, the teacher would pin the picture on the big wall map we had put up showing where the letter had come from and how far the balloon had traveled. It was a really smart idea because we actually looked forward to coming to school to see if we had gotten our letter. For the duration of the year, we had one day a week where we could write back to our pen pal or another student's pen pal in case our letter hadn't come in yet. Mine was one of the last to arrive. When I came into the classroom, I looked at my desk and once again, didn't see any letter waiting for me. But as I sat down, the teacher approached me and handed me an envelope. I must have looked so excited because as I was about to open it, she put her hand on mine to stop me and said, please don't be upset. I didn't understand what she meant. Why would I be upset that my letter had come? Initially, I was mystified that she would even know what was in the envelope. But now I realized that, of course, the teachers had screened the contents to make sure there was nothing obscene. But all the same, how could I be disappointed? When I opened the envelope, I understood. There was no letter. The only thing in the envelope was a Polaroid, but I couldn't really make out what it was. It looked like a patch of desert, but it was too blurry to decipher. It appeared as if the camera had been moved while the picture was being taken. There was no return address, so I couldn't even write back if I wanted to. I was crushed. The school year pressed on, and the letters had stopped coming for nearly all the other students. After all, you can only continue a written correspondence with a kindergartner for so long. Everyone, including myself, had lost interest in the letters almost completely. Then I got another envelope. My excitement was rejuvenated, and I had reveled in the fact that I was still getting a letter when most of the other pen pals had abandoned their involvement. It made sense that I received another delivery. There had been nothing but a blurry picture in the first one, so this was probably, probably to make up for that. But again, there was no letter at all. Just another picture. This one was more distinguishable, but I still didn't understand it. 
The photograph was angled way up, catching the top corner of a building, and the rest of the image was distorted by a lens flare from the sun. Because the balloons didn't travel very far, and because they were all launched on the same day, the board became a bit cluttered. And so the policy for the students still exchanging letters became, became that they could take the photograph home. My best friend Josh had the second highest number of pictures taken home by the end of the year. His pen pal was really cooperative and sent him pictures from all around the neighboring city. Josh took home, I think, four pictures? I took home nearly 50. The envelopes were all opened by the teacher, but after a while I stopped even looking at the pictures. However, I saved them in one of my drawers that housed my collection of rocks, baseball cards, comic book cards, Marvel Metal cards for those who might remember, and little miniature baseball batting helmets that I'd get out of a vending machine at Winn-Dixie after t-ball games. With the school year over, my attention turned to other things. My mom had gotten me a small snow cone machine for Christmas that year, and Josh had really coveted it. So much so that his parents bought him a slightly nicer one for his birthday, which was towards the end of the school year. The summer, or that summer, we had the idea that we would set up a snow cone stand to make money. We thought we'd make a fortune selling snow cones at one dollar. Josh lived in a different neighborhood, but we eventually decided that my neighborhood would be better because there were a lot more people who cared for their lawns. The yards in my neighborhood were slightly bigger. We did this for about five weekends in a row until my mom told us that we had to stop, and I've only recently come to understand why she did that. On the fifth weekend, Josh and I were counting our money, because we both had a machine, and we each had a separate sack of money that we put together into one stack, and we would then would split it evenly. We had made a total of $16 that day, and as Josh paid out my fifth dollar, a feeling of profound surprise consumed me. The dollar said, for stamps. Josh noticed my shock and asked if he had miscounted. I told him about the dollar and he said, that's so cool, man. As I thought about it, I came to agree. The idea that the dollar had made it right back to me after changing so many hands floored me. I rushed inside to tell my mom, but my excitement, coupled with her being distracted by a phone call, made my story incomprehensible and she responded simply by saying, oh wow, that's neat. Frustrated, I ran back outside and told Josh I had something to show him. Back in my room, I opened the drawer and took out the stack of envelopes and showed him some of the pictures. I started with the first picture, and we went through about ten before Josh lost the interest and asked if I wanted to go play in the ditch, a dirt ditch down the street from my house, before his mom came to pick him up. So that's what we did. We had a dirt war for a while, but it was interrupted several times by rustling in the woods around us. There were raccoons and stray cats that lived in there, but this was making a little too much noise, and we traded guesses at what it was in an attempt to scare each other. My last guess was that it was a mummy, but in the end Josh kept insisting that it was a robot because of the sounds that we heard. Before we left, he got a little serious and looked me right in the eye and said, You heard it, didn't you? It sounded like a robot. It sounded like a robot. You heard it too, right? I had heard it, and since it sounded mechanical, I agreed that it was probably a robot. It's only now that I understand what we heard. When we got back, Josh's mom was waiting for him at the kitchen table with my mom. Josh told his mom about the robot, our moms laughed, and Josh went home. My mom and I ate dinner, and then I went to bed. I didn't stay in bed for long before I crept out and decided that due to the day's events, I would revisit the envelope since now the whole affair seemed much more interesting. I took the first envelope and set it on the floor and set the blurry desert Polaroid on top. I laid the second envelope right next to it and placed the oddly angled Polaroid of a building's top corner on top and did this with each picture until they formed a grid that was about 5 by 10. I was always taught to be careful with things that I was collecting even if I wasn't sure they were valuable. I noticed that the pictures gradually became more decipherable. There was a tree with a bird on it, a speed limit sign, power line, a group of people walking into some building. And then I saw something that vexed me so powerfully that I can now, as I write this, distinctly remember feeling dizzy and capable of only a single repeating thought. Why am I in this picture? In this photograph of the group of people entering the building, I saw myself holding hands with my mother in the very back of the crowd of people. 
We were at the very edge of the photo, but it was undeniably us. And as my eyes swam over the sea of Polaroids, I became increasingly anxious. It was a really odd feeling. It wasn't fear, it was the feeling you get when you were in trouble. I'm not sure why I was flooded with that feeling, but there I sat, floundering in the distinct sense that I had done something wrong. And this feeling only intensified as I looked on at the rest of the photos after that one had become so powerful to me. I was in every photo. None of them were close shots. None of them were only of me. But I was in every single one of them. Off to the side, in the back, bottom of the frame. Some of them only had the tiniest part of my face captured at the end edge of the photo, but... Nevertheless, I was there. I was always there. I didn't know what to do. Your mind works in funny ways as a kid, but there was a large part of me that was afraid of getting in trouble simply for still being up. Since I already had the looming feeling of having done something wrong, I decided that I would wait until tomorrow. The next day, my mom was off work and spent most of the morning cleaning up around the house. I watched cartoons, I imagine, and waited until the thought of it was a good time to show her the Polaroids. When she went out to get the mail, I grabbed a couple of the pictures and put them on the table in front of me as I sat waiting for her to come back in. When she returned, she was already opening the mail and threw some junk mail into the trash can and I said, Mom, can you come here for a second? I have these pictures. Just give me a minute, honey. I need to mark these on the calendar. After a minute or two, she came and stood behind me and asked me what I needed. I could hear her shuffling with the mail behind me, but I just looked at the Polaroids and told her about them. As I explained more and pointed to the pictures, her frequent uh-huh and okay decreased and she was suddenly completely quiet and only making a little noise with the mail. The next noise I heard from her sounded as if she was trying to catch her breath in a room that had no air left in it. At last, her struggling gasps were conquered, and she simply dropped the remaining mail on the table and ran to the kitchen to get the phone. Mom, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know about these. Don't be mad at me. With the phone pressed to her ear, she was walking slash running back and forth, shouting into it. I nervously fiddled with the mail sitting next to my Polaroids. The top envelope had something sticking out of it that I had thoughtlessly and anxiously pulled on until it came out. It was another Polaroid. Confused, I thought that somehow one of my Polaroids had slipped into the stack when she threw the mail down, but when I turned it over and looked at it, I realized that I had not seen this one before. To my dismay, it was me, but this one was a much closer shot. I was surrounded by trees and was smiling, but it wasn't just me. I noticed Josh was there too. This was us from yesterday. I started yelling for my mom, who was still screaming into the phone. I repeatedly yelled for her until she finally responded with, What? And I could only think to ask, Who are you calling? I'm talking with the police, honey. But why? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do anything. She answered me with a response that I never understood until I was forced to revisit these events from the earliest years of my life. She grabbed the envelope off the table, and the picture of Josh and I spun and slid, landing next to the other Polaroids in front of me. She held the envelope up to my eyes, but I could only look at her and watch as all the color began draining out of her face. With tears welling up in her eyes, she said that she had to call the police because there was no postmark. All right, that's going to be the end of part one of Pen Pals. I hope you guys like that. That, uh, that gave me a couple chills right down my spine. I'm a little tingly right now. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Let me know down in the comments how you're liking it and if you like it. And um, yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Bye!